Uh, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another uh, Delop talk. Uh, my name is Lukas Jonak, and I'm with the uh, Digital Economy Lab of Warsaw University. And today we'll talk about the uh, prospect, prospects of enhancing democracy by modern technologies. And uh, two distinguished guests will help us navigate this topic. From Canada, uh, we welcome Carl Schroeder. Uh, he's a writer of speculative fiction in many forms, in form of science fiction, in forms of uh, young adult uh, novels, and especially now uh, uh, he also <coughs> writes uh, uh, foresight scenarios for uh, various institutions, governmental, non-governmental, commercial. And what's important for me as sociologist uh, in his writing is that in literally every work I can find some, some very crucial to, to, to my field ideas that they just are developed uh, a step or two beyond of what we are, of, of what we are um, used to or comfortable with in, in our field. So if any of you would like to uh, remain a step or two uh, in, front on, in, front of, uh, in front of every other peer uh, in your field, uh, you should definitely um, uh, try and read some of Carl Schroeder's work. And also we have Professor Anna Giza Poleszczuk. Uh, she's a, a sociologist. Uh, she was uh, writing and researching uh, the nature of social bonds, but perhaps she's most known uh, both in academia, academia and public um, real life um, uh, by her um, researching the theory and practice of um, uh, civil society. Um, and especially she's a researcher of the ways the self-knowledge and knowledge about society is being produced. Mm -hmm. And she's very critical about that also. Uh, and recently she targeted marketing as a tool of creating this kind of knowledge. And uh, she should uh, uh, have her um, next book published uh, really soon. And I um, encourage you to, to check this work as well. Thank you. And with these, <laughs> with these introductions, I would like to start with very general uh, very general uh, questions, um, and I would like to ask, because we are in academia right now in, in Warsaw uh, University Library, I would like to ask about uh, how do you, where do you stand on the issues of whether humans are wired for collaboration, for political solving of problems, whether they are actually wired for that and just need some help to be able to do that efficiently, or maybe it's the other way around. Maybe we basically we need some kind of coercive force uh, that that uh, will take away some of our freedom, but for our own good, so that we basically can li live live to, to, to together. And maybe we will uh, start with with Carl Schroeder uh, as our guest. Are you starting with the easy questions? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, there, there's a relatively new theory uh, called altruistic brain theory, which posits that uh, uh, human beings have a instinct for altruism, for helping other people, um, that is as fundamental as the instinct for language. Uh, I am not sure that I believe this yet. I will believe it when there's been a decade or two of solid empirical study that that, that proves it, uh, but it is an interesting uh, approach and an interesting perspective. Um, the suggestion is that uh, the automatic reaction that we have as human beings to seeing another human being in need is to help that person. Uh, and it is only, we, we are socialized out of doing so, rather than needing to be socialized into helping other people. Now, this is, is good, but of course, it, uh, it lacks the nuance that a really useful theory has. And, and in particular, it doesn't really account for the fact that there's no such thing as a bare human or a, a human <coughs> in nature. Um, humans are, by nature, technological. <coughs> and so everything we do is always mediated by our technologies, whether that's clothing, housing, um, the means that we use to communicate. Uh, it, it's no accident I'm, I'm you know, talking that way because I come from Marshall McLuhan's 
part of the world. Uh, and uh, he would say, yes, the, the media always affect how we communicate. And so they necessarily affect how we relate to each other on ethical and moral levels as well. Okay, and how about Professor Lisa? Mm. What are your views on, on this problem? I think that there are very, uh, quite a lot of proofs that we are wired for uh, being altruistic and uh, for collaborate, cooperating with uh, other human beings, although I am not sure whether this is genetically wired or whether this is something uh, that uh, can be proved in, uh, in the long run mm -hmm. and with a lot of iterations. I'm talking about evolutionary theory of games that proves uh, above uh, all doubts, I would say, that basically in the long run we are all better off collaborating or cooperating. So basically right. my idea would be that what we call the social norms or uh, ethics is something that evolved in mm -hmm. order to create something inside us uh, to be to collaborate before we uh, uh, have to learn it from experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, b basically, because. Uh, uh, what, what I also have in mind is that there are a lot of experiments in the so-called uh, experimental theory of games. Uh, namely, for example, there is a very famous dictatorship game uh, that has been played in many cultures with people from Amazonia forest uh, uh, up to the most sophisticated uh, human beings in the uh, Western world. And in all of those instances, the, in all the, the, those experiments, people did not behave according to this uh, homo economicus idea, namely, they collaborated or cooperated against their best uh, egoist, uh, selfish interest. And uh, afterwards, I do not want to go into details about the dictatorship game that is uh, quite interesting, but basically when afterwards they were asked, uh, why haven't you taken uh, almost all money for yourself? They were saying, well, because this was not fair. So basically this idea of fairness, of justice, uh, of compassion is something that uh, maybe has to be rebuilt in each generation by mm -hmm. socialization. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but basically this is something that I believe we have inborn almost. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult to separate those two mm. realms, the, the inborn and, and the, the, the socialized. Uh, I, I, I'm always, uh, I always question any study that claims that mm. they have been able to find that it is one or the other. Uh, they almost always go hand in hand. Yeah, but what I have in mind is that I sincerely believe uh, that uh, uh, in socialization we have to strengthen or to mm -hmm. uh, create experience that help people to all the time replenish, so to say. Sure. Yeah, the yeah. resources that they have for altruism, of uh, compassion, love, and all those nice feelings. Uh, that we all would like uh, to mm -hmm. have. Yep. Uh, I, uh, for example, when I, when I think about my own uh, childhood, when we uh, all had uh, toxic mothers, mm -hmm. yeah? <laughs> 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 that forced us to go to church and do other things. <laughs> uh, uh, this was, uh, uh, these were such innocent times mm. by which I mean that the books that I read were all very sentimental. It was all about doing good to other people like Amitis and others. Mm -hmm. yeah? So basically uh, the dreams of myself and my colleagues were about helping somebody, rescuing somebody. This was something that mm. was kind of very vivid in ourselves and of course Films were also very innocent. There was no cruelty, uh, no death. Uh, when you think about even the old westerns, I mean, they, they, they were so innocent. So basically, uh, my generation still today, most probably is not able to watch cruelty. I mm. just can't stand it, you know? Mm. There is something that hurts, aches, 
inside myself and this is something that I cannot uh, bear. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so you, you are absolutely right, but in a sense I believe that we need to uh, all the time uh, strengthen and uh, replenish because of course we, we invest our good feelings in other people. Well, this is certainly something we could spend the rest of the afternoon on because there are questions such as can you architecturally create a built environment that channels people's behavior into mm. more altruistic modes? In other words, can you have sociology in the built environment mm. or of the built environment? Um, and uh, I would suggest that if you look at the, the for instance, the brutalist or, or, or Nazi architecture of uh, mm. Spear and, uh, and that, that generation, they were trying to do that. They mm. were trying to uh, uh, put an ideology in mm. physical form. Um, and if that is possible at a limit, then a whole range of other interventions uh, from that down to personal interactions may be possible using our technologies that mediate mm. how we uh, uh, connect with one another. Mm. You were talking uh, today in the morning about uh, uh, trust that is built into technologies, yeah, mm -hmm. so uh, supported by, and, and I believe this is, uh, uh, this is something uh, very, very important. I always uh, have a problem with people who talk about trust, like trust uh, would be something that is inborn. Mm. I think that we learn to trust people that we le or to distrust people. Mm -hmm. So basically there is all the time this interaction between the environment and uh, our experience that uh, leads us toward this or that. Yeah, I, I know we'd like to, to move on. I just want to mm. add one comment to that, which is that the technologies I was speaking about this morning were basically built on the homo economicus model of that's interactions. Right. And that's very important to bear in mind mm. as we go forward with them. Mm. And uh, so, uh, we, so we seem to be of mind that, that basically we are wired and made to, to be, to be uh, reasonable with each other and to be political to some extent. Mm -hmm. But we can see that so often it doesn't, it doesn't work or, or this process of, of the liberation of creating solutions is just, uh, just um, drift somewhere in the, in the areas that we would, we, would like, we would not like it to, to, to wander to, right? So my next question would be, maybe briefly uh, for you to try to identify maybe why this happens uh, uh, while we are, we, we, we are uh, wired for corporations and maybe also, and this is perhaps more important, what are the, the one or two most important problems, issues with, with, with this kind of uh, um, uh, with ki kind of uh, communal living, with democracy, with public li life, uh, what do you think is the most pressing issue or the most important issue that should be either fixed or maybe strength strengthened or, or addressed? Uh, and maybe uh, Professor Giza could start. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you for this question because it leads me to my old obsession, uh, uh, which is... Uh, uh, about uh, uh, our awareness and the way we think. Uh, I, in our, uh, I mean, human beings, uh, in human beings, everything starts with the way we think and, uh, uh, and with what we think. So basically, if you ask me about the problems with uh, democracy, deliberation, cooperation, and so on and so on, this is because we live uh, in the uh, emperor's old uh, new dress fairy tale, by which I mean this is called by psychologists and, uh, uh, the phenomenon of collective ignorance. Mm. So basically we do not, uh, we are not sure what others people know, what others people think. Uh, and this is because the mechanism of generating common knowledge 
has been distorted have been distorted by media and by civilization. Uh, maybe this is not very clear, but what I have in mind is that basically uh, we are able to build common knowledge with people that we interact and we can ask them what do you see, what do you believe, are you for this or for that. But when it comes to society, mm -hmm. which means in Poland 38 million people, mm -hmm. we can only learn about this big mass society from media. Yeah? And uh, this creates this uh, collective ignorance phenomenon because basically I can always believe that I know very strange people uh, who think like, like I do, mm -hmm. but all other 38 almost million people are totally different. And it also shows in sociological surveys because if you <coughs> ask the very same uh, group of people two questions about the same issue, but uh, one question is very general, let us say whether uh, people, uh, whether uh, Poland is a safe country. So this is very general question because obviously I cannot know all Poland from my own experience and I cannot check it. So the only way I can build my imagination about safety in Poland is from <coughs> media, from experts and uh, so on and so on. And the same person is asking another question which is uh, uh, do you feel safe uh, in your environment, in your neighborhood? Then we can see that 99% uh, of people feel safe mm -hmm. in their neighborhood, right. but the same 99% of people believe there is not safe in Poland, <laughs> which is of course a paradox because mm -hmm. this is representative sample <laughs> And this is exactly the illustration of this uh, new emperor's uh, dress mm -hmm. uh, phenomenon, that uh, I see something, but maybe I'm not competent, you know, mm -hmm. because only competent people can see the emperor's new beautiful dress. Yeah. Uh, I, I, yeah, I definitely agree with, with that. The uh, one other aspect of it that I see is that, um, uh, if you ask a question about what is the cause of something, when in fact uh, what is occurring is a, a complex systemic um, phenomenon, then you will not find a cause. Uh, and uh, uh, much of what we deal with is contextual, local, um, complex, and systemic. Uh, and uh, I, I don't really believe that there are universal problems or universal solutions to be found. Although the, you've and, uh, reached us up to a meta level, as it were, uh, above the, the, the problem space. But there, there's an old um, term from systems thinking, the problematique, which mm. is the problem of problems, mm -hmm. if you will. Uh, and I think we, we often deal with that when we're uh, talking about issues of, you know, democracy in the abstract. Um, but I just wanted to mention that there are methodological approaches to, to some of these uh, issues. There's a, um, a methodology known as structured dialogic design, which was uh, developed by, I um, uh, forget his first name, uh, Christakos. Uh, and uh, some other sociologists uh, about 15 years ago. And the, it's a workshop methodology. So it's for getting groups that are in conflict to uh, agree on the problem and then agree on solutions. Now they used this in Cyprus uh, and were very successful with it. Um, but one of the features of this methodology is that you spend a couple of days as a group finding out what people mean when they use a specific mm. word. So when I say the word war, what do I mean? It may be completely different from what you say, mean when you say the word. Uh, and in the process of sitting down with possibly with enemies that you're trying to negotiate with over the table, uh, if you do not know what they mean, 
when they use a fundamental word in your shared language, then you are not going to communicate at all, and you are not going to resolve your problems. So only once a shared vocabulary has been built up is the group able to move forward to actually uh, addressing what the question is. And this is, again, where it gets interesting. You ask the, the group what they think the problem is, and you will get a list of, of answers. Uh, and then you go through an exercise in which you say, would addressing problem A fix problem B? Would addressing problem B fix problem A? You do this for a while, and it's good to use a computer to, tr to track this stuff. And what almost inevitably happens is that what people have listed as the problems turn out to be the symptoms mm. of a single root or a couple of root problems that they were talking about as the symptom. In other words, uh, the, the whole perspective on the issue flips or inverts itself. And it's only at that point where the group can begin to talk about solutions. Uh, so you can see how dealing with real problems in the real world can be an extremely time-consuming, arduous, high-commitment activity. This is why we have politics, mm -hmm. because we have people who get, are committed to doing that, um, whereas most of us would like to, to say, well, this is the problem, obviously, and this is obviously the solution. Why don't we all agree? Mm -hmm. um, it's inevitably more complex than that. So just to follow up on, on, on actually your answer, so because, uh, well, you kind of avoided the, 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 the straightforward you know, identifying one sure. or, or two, two reasons. <laughs> and uh, as far as I understood, you, you, you're saying that what, what we, the problem is not the, the single, the single, one single singular cause. It's more like intersection of, of maybe small circumstances than when combined they, 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 uh, they make people who are well, prone to, 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 to be collaborative, political, to actually uh, act, uh, act uh, not necessarily towards the common good and uh, consequently their own good, or basically make a system that doesn't work this uh, way. Yes, but if you really wanted to, if you wanted me to put a stake in the sand, as we say, mm -hmm. um, maybe what I'm saying is that uh, we think causally in terms of simple cause and effect mm -hmm. in situations where that logic does not apply. Uh, and mm -hmm. we um, attempt to find solutions before we have even finished formulating the question. Mm -hmm. uh, th those are two fundamental issues. And mm -hmm. I would not say that those are the, the causes, because that would again be using simple causal uh, thinking. But uh, and, uh, what I could say is that addressing those issues could reduce our problems, mm -hmm. um, uh, rather than saying, you know, th to invert the causal thing, if we fix this, everything else is fixed. It's not the way it works. So how does it relate to the, to the concept of wicked problem that you, problems that you, that, 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 that you were talking about? Uh, uh, do, you, do, do, you, do you think that, that, that whenever we've got some problems with collective uh, decision making, collective conduct, it's, it's the, the case of, of wicked problem um, uh, appearing, emerging, uh, and causing us, you know, behaving not in, not in suboptimal way. Sometimes, mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> but not always. Um, the, uh, there's a book that uh, I don't know if people in sociology read. It's uh, um, a, a New Kind of Science by uh, Stephen Wolfram. Mm -hmm. um, Wolfram has stolen most of his ideas from other people, but that's a separate issue. <laughs> um, one thing that he does identify in, in, in that book is um, that very, very simple systems can have behaviors that are, by definition, fundamentally unpredictable. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you suggest, for instance, a simple system of four people um, that system is already too complex to predict. 
This is why, as a futurist, I say I never predict. A prediction is literally impossible for most of the uh, issues that we as human beings are concerned about. Mm -hmm. um, the, and the, 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 a wicked problem cannot be fixed. The, one of the, the, the definitions of a wicked problem is that it cannot be fixed, it can only be improved. Uh, so considering politics as a wicked problem, um, we cannot fix politics, but we can perhaps improve it. Mm -hmm. And uh, that improvement, I personally believe, was not going to come from any single intervention, but from a spectrum of different approaches by different people with different models, um, acting so as not to get in one another's way, mm -hmm. but otherwise uh, acting in some cases independently. Mm -hmm. um, it's, uh, if you're talking wicked problems, then you have to throw out the whole logic of this is what's wrong and this is how I fix it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so this is naturally leading us to the, to, to the next issue of how those problems could be addressed or could be maybe resolved or at least improved mm -hmm. using uh, technologies. They might be actually the technology that we even don't think as technologies anymore, but they might be the technologies that we are using uh, right now and maybe some emerging technologies. So what I would like to ask you, how would uh, technologies uh, address the issues of creating common knowledge, better ways of creating common knowledge, mm -hmm or trying to, 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 to break the, uh, the, the, the vicious circles of, of, uh, uh, of wicked problems. Uh, what are the ways in, in, in current technologies to, to, to maybe do that, Carl? Um. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very good question. Um, and again, I don't think that there is a single answer. I, I recently wrote a short story uh, it, titled uh, Degrees of Freedom, which was included in an anthology known as Hieroglyph, mm -hmm. uh, published in the United States. Um, and uh, it was an attempt to uh, answer some of those questions. I created a notional uh, website called wegetit.com, uh, and there was only it, it was a discussion board style of website, but there was only, only one action available to you, and that was to agree. <laughs> so you either agree with someone's statement or you remain silent. Um, and uh, the, 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 the purpose of this is to create communities that, as in a structured dialogic design exercise, agree on the meanings of certain statements. And it's only once you have a uh, identified group of people who share a common language that you can move on to the next step, which is defining and solving problems together. So uh, in other words, what I was doing in that story was starting several steps back from where most people would start. Most people would start by saying, what's the problem? To me, that's far, far ahead of where you need to start. Mm. And maybe to to how would you how would you uh, how would you propose actually uh, a procedure basically to generate to generate uh, uh, the common knowledge and to see the the the, 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 the emperor's clothes the way they, they really are. <laughs> Do you have any idea about that? How how could you, you know, solve that? Uh, I, I I do not think that I have uh, any kind of bright ideas. Uh, I rather think about uh, training virtues, mm. mm -hmm. uh, staying humble, mm -hmm. asking questions, not jumping to conclusions, mm -hmm. respecting other people, mm -hmm. and also it means changing the way we are trained to think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Because I believe that our key training, especially at schools, is there is always one right answer to each question. Yes. Yeah? <laughs> Uh, if you do not answer immediately, but you start asking additional questions, it means that you, you do not know. Right. Yeah? <laughs> uh, 
Uh, all this kind of training is very, very much uh, um, still present at schools, mm -hmm. which means that people are afraid to have doubts, mm -hmm. that uh, people are, uh, in a sense, uh, uh, encouraged uh, to have quick answers to anything. Right. Yeah? Uh, so, so this is one thing. I, I, I think uh, more and more often about uh, really about uh, this kind of very modest uh, mm. things that we can do with uh, other uh, people, and maybe there is some technology that can help us. I, I had thought a couple of years back of uh, uh, an idea I call the new manners, mm. uh, and uh, I have not written this down anywhere. But the idea is. Um, cognitive science spends some time um, finding out what ways of interaction with people mm. really, you know, are beneficial or are, are not, and uh, creates a, a new handbook of manners. Yeah, lovely. Um, yes. Uh, that hopefully transcends culture because it's based on the lower levels of the, the primate brain. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, threat and response and, and things like this. Um, and uh, a, a global movement, this would be what happens in the story if I write a story, mm. a global movement um, arises of uh, new manners people who adopt this vocabulary of ways of interacting. Mm. Um, I, I love this idea. Yeah. Really. I uh, think that we should start. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. But, but to build on that, I also believe that uh, there is uh, 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 quite a lot of responsibility on the side of science and especially social sciences because we used to tell people in this kind of expert way this is the way life is. Hmm. What, can you th uh, what can you know about labor market? I tell you this right. is this and this and this. So, so basically this kind of uh, generalizations that kill all those uh, tiny things that you are talking about and basically this is what our life is about mm -hmm. yeah this is the context of our life so basically this is also about uh, stay being more humble and open on the side of sciences instead of uh, uh, just you know trying to be expert but i also believe that there is a slightly that we are a little bit afraid because of our culture to be incompetent. And that's mm. why I am back in this uh, new emperor's dress fairy tale. Right. Because this fairy tale is about being afraid to be perceived as stupid. Right. And this is something that we also need to tackle somehow. Mm -hmm. I agree, yes. Um. Okay, so uh, this is a little bit strange because we well, I was hoping that, that there will be some kind of technological vision that will solve <laughs> our all, you know, problem with, with, with uh, our politics and our democracy that you would, would maybe propose. But it looks like that there is uh, only so much that can be done uh, instrumentally uh, in terms of technology, uh, like a hard technology. But there is a lot, a lot of to, to be done uh, in terms of uh, basically socialization. Uh, uh, building manners and 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 uh, building characters. Um, but but uh, sorry, Wukash, uh, I have to say that. But this, what what are you talking about? Is technology? Well, exactly. But mm -hmm. yeah. so so this is why I distinguished hard technologies, and yeah. these are also technologies. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Yes. Well, the question would be how wh where is this where is this uh, wh where is this border between hard technologies and those and those. Uh, uh, soft technologies, social technologies. How can, and maybe this, this border can be moved, right? Maybe some of those um, mm. techniques of, 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 of family, of society, of, of socializations can be somehow in, incorporated into, into harder ways of, of, of creating uh, a, a polity. And whether we, we really uh, uh, need that and want that. And I don't know. Maybe, maybe the the the, um, uh, the case of social media that that we thought that it would create uh, a space for citizens to 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 uh, to uh, express themselves and maybe create some kind of political space. It failed. Uh, could it be because there was lacking there was a lack of those 
uh, soft techniques. Uh, good uh, manners. Good manners that would prepare people to basically uh, to 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 uh, to, to uh, enter this this world of free discourse. Sure, uh, social media is inherently elitist anyway. I mean, the um, my my definition of a or, or example of a citizen, for instance, I, I live in Canada in, in Toronto, which is a hugely multicultural city. So my definition of a citizen, Canadian citizen, is an elderly Chinese woman who never learned English uh, and never got a job in the normal marketplace, but raised eight kids um, and ha had a role in her local community for her entire life. That is a citizen. Yes. If you do not have um, a political system that works for that citizen and that which that citizen can use, then you don't have a, a working political system. Uh, is she going to use the internet? Is she going to use a smartphone and like people on Facebook? No. So yeah, of course, that, that particular experiment was doomed. Um, now, a friend of mine, Jason Deisman, has invented a system he calls Dotmocracy, <coughs> which uses paper, Xerox machines, and pencils. Uh, and he took it into uh, small communities in Colombia, in um, South America, uh, where they had a problem of the local community would get together to decide an issue, and there would be a strong voice or two, the local landowner or the, the elders or whoever. They would be the ones speaking, and their ideas would be the ones promoted. So Jason developed a little paper and pencil sh worksheet that you could hand out to everyone where they would write down what they thought the problem was um, and not sign it with their name. Then you shuffle them all together and put them up against a wall or tape them to a wall and people come up and vote. So each voice has equal weight. The, the wealthy lo local landowner uh, is indistinguishable from the grandmother when they're, they're anonymous sheets of paper tacked on the wall. And at the end of the, the process, people have voted on what they think the real issues are, and uh, you know what the community thinks. It's not just the strong voice speaking. So that's an example of inherently low technology, portable. Um, he's made these worksheets available on his website so you can download them. And it only takes one person to take them into the community, hand out a bunch of pencils, um, and assuming that people are literate, which of course <laughs> this does, but um, uh, at least it's, it's far closer to that level of engagement with the, this notional citizen than r demanding that they have computer skills, demanding that they be online, and so on and so forth. Um, so, sorry, that was a bit of a passionate answer, but... <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I think this is uh, absolutely uh, uh, true, what are, you, what are you talking about? And I believe that we've uh, made up a kind of the monumental ideas, like mm -hmm. citizen, somebody who is uh, God knows what. Mm -hmm. You are absolutely right. Unless we are able to listen to normal people, and to understand what they are saying, we have uh, nothing on our table. Uh, ironically, this is a reason why we probably need to retain much of the 17th century political apparatus of mm -hmm. voting and uh, regions and, and uh, representatives, um, because those are inherently well, it's not that they're low technology, but that they're able to reach uh, into areas where high technology can't. So, you are, are you are you skeptical about the uh, the prospects of of uh, uh, of global reach of, of technologies such as uh, blockchain, Bitcoin, economy, peer to peer economy? Uh, no, uh, I I recently am working on. Um, a model of the commons mm -hmm. uh, that runs on the blockchain. And that, in fact, is what my current novel is about. Um, uh, because I believe that blockchain technology and uh, commons are a perfect fit for one another. 
Uh, and uh, so I'm, I'm seeking to, to create e examples for that. But wh what I feel is that if high technology is going to be used and is going to be useful, it has to have low technology access or interfaces mm -hmm. to it. So it has to be accessible to people who do not know that high level, uh, who are not programmers, who are not um, uh, computer literate even, or even literate. There, there, there has to be access for everyone for it to be an equitable system. Okay, so uh, this is really interesting because you, earlier you said that that um, whatever is going with uh, with uh, Bitcoin technology, Bitcoin um, currency, etc., these kind of technologies, they're very much uh, homo economicus, one-to-one, peer-to-peer um, um, centered. Uh, and this is great news, I guess, for economists that are a few here, because they kind of like this kind of uh, 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 easy to model uh, systems that, that, that consist of atomic atomic transactions and, and actors. But we uh, sociologists like to think about the emerging, uh, the emerging structures of communities. Hmm. Uh, and maybe, and, and maybe you've, you, you, you could just uh, give some hints about how these technologies that are really st strengthening the, the ways in which people can trustfully interact with each other, how can they scale up and maybe uh, uh, Contribute to creating uh, a stable, uh, stable uh, communities. How, how is, is there an, a way, a path from this this one-to-one uh, -one mechanism to creating actually communities, common knowledge, uh, common uh, definitions of problems and their solutions? Well, I'm I'm happy that you're still asking me the simple questions. <laughs> but uh, no, I. But this is what I am thinking about lately. Um, and uh, I, I, I'm grateful for the chance to, to, to actually speak about it. Um, I have, in, in recent stories, and I, again, I usually communicate in fiction, uh, and uh, I, I would modestly prefer to be thought of as a, a, an author rather than a, a, a thinker, and I'm certainly not an academic thinker. Um, uh, so I have been representing the idea of using blockchain technology um, to identify or give an identity to natural systems, um, such as forests, pods of whales, uh, packs of wolves, um, individual trees, uh, units of carbon, and, and so on. Um, so that they can be treated as uh, independent entities. Uh, in, in the stories that I've been writing, uh, in one story, for instance, um, a forest uh, acquires an artificial intelligence computer that thinks it is the forest. And because it is a homo economicus kind of artificial intelligence, it acts to maximize its own benefit. But because it thinks it's a forest, it acts to protect the forest. Mm -hmm. mm. uh, uh, next month, I'll be in Moscow speaking at uh, uh, Geek Picnic, I believe it's called. Mm. Um, and I'll be talking about the, this alternative vision of artificial intelligence, where uh, we create systems that identify as natural systems. Um, the blockchain can help be, because it is a registry system. Mm -hmm. It's a system for registering that this is a that. Um, we can use a combination of that and artificial intelligence, or so I'm saying, um, to wake up the natural world uh, so that it becomes a partner and a political actor in its own right. So in, in that short story, the, the uh, forest um, begins to negotiate, um, sell off, it sells off part of itself to local landowners, it takes the money, invests it in lawyers, and sues people who are trying to um, <laughs> chop down another part. Uh, so, it, yeah, uh, it's perfectly rational action. And, and then it may turn around and take some of the other money and uh, pay, pay lobbyists to go to the government to try and get it protected, mm -hmm. as a park, let's say. 
Um, so uh, uh, we're entering a realm historically where strange new things are possible. And the, and the blockchain by itself is, is weird and very difficult to figure out mm -hmm. in, in terms of its implications. But it will not, it will never act alone. As blockchain technology develops, other technologies will develop in parallel with it, such as artificial intelligence, and they will work together. Uh, this is why I write this material as stories, because it's almost impossible to get people to believe it if you write it down in any other form. Uh, uh, and it's also inherently complex. But uh, that's the current vision. Um, I'm probably wrong. But uh, it's an interesting approach, and what it, what it does is bring to light some of our assumptions. For instance, that forests are not political actors. Uh, Bruno Latour, who we were talking yes. about earlier, would say they are. Um, but uh, even he has repudiated his own <laughs> philosophy at this point. Um, but uh, they could be literally made into political actors um, at some point. Um, in any, in any case, the blockchain by itself, as a incorruptible registry system, is going to have an impact on citizenship, voting, um, and many of the uh, activities that governments perform currently as trusted third parties. Mm -hmm. So that is a point of entry for us to understand it uh, and to engage with it over the next few years. Uh, that's a long roundabout answer. I hope it made some sense. Okay, so we started with trying to to see how technology can empower people and we just <laughs> arrived at at, at, <laughs> at, uh, at at point where, where we just see that uh, technologies can empower non non persons, non people non -human. rather. Mm -hmm. And so I, I'm kind of uh, afraid to, to go any further. So maybe it's time to, <laughs> to, to because I don't know where we could get to. Uh, but maybe it's time we got uh, five or ten minutes more uh, to get a couple of questions from from the audience. So if uh, somebody would like to ask something uh, to our panelists. Or to comment. Or to comment. Protest. Protest, yes. <laughs> uh, okay, okay. okay. Uh, I guess kind of a comment and a question. Um, it should I think, uh, I think it's a really interesting idea, the one of giving agency through AI to a forest or um, a park or whatever. But I think an interesting question there is also actually when you're creating that AI, what human judgments or ideas about what the forest needs or what the forest is are you putting into that AI? Mm. Um, I think that's kind of an interesting exploration. Um, and then I had another point that I've forgotten. Um, there, w there was another thing also um, coming back to uh, getting a common understanding of problems or issues or ideas. And I think that's the first step. And the second step, the part of the problem with democracy, is the way that I see it, is, it, is that most people don't understand most of the issues that, that they need to comment on. And, and the, obviously the first step of that is actually understanding what the issue means. But then how do you provide those people with information for them to to then make the democratic decision about what they think should happen. Mm -hmm. uh, and systems like change.org, uh, 38 Degrees, are really bad for this because they, they perpetrate a lot of misinformation uh, and confuse those stories and, and, and are kind of part of the issue. Mm -hmm. So how do we get around that? Be a question. Uh, in some of my stories, I talk about a, a system called Sim Canada, which is a, uh, a simulation of the entire country uh, economic and political and ecological that is accessible for all citizens and that they can play with. So uh, you can enact a policy that is being talked about, debated for parliament in Sim Canada and run the simulation and see what happens. And of course it's based on various assumptions, but in, in, in realizing that it's based on the assumptions, you learn the, uh, about those assumptions. Um, uh, so, again, th there are potential economic levers or, or uh, technological levers, but again, they are also not solutions. But I just wanted to say that, that, that there was a reason why I came back to empowering 
non-human systems um, as an answer to the question of how we empower people, because I don't see a difference. Um, I, I, I see that we have a very large blind spot in, in, our, in our thinking about actually what we are. Um, and uh, uh, what I'm doing a lot in my stories is creating metaphors for um, expanding the notion of what is human, not in the, the, the transhumanist sense of we will, you know, shuffle off this mortal coil and, uh, you know, upload ourselves into robots. But um, realizing, for instance, that if you live in the forest, you are part of the forest. Absolutely. And yeah. you are part of that political actor. Um, if you're contributing to the forest, you are part of that uh, entity. So it, it, it is actually an attempt to broaden the idea of human identity. Um, and uh, so my thesis that I'm operating from here is that we cannot actually move forward uh, to resolve a lot of our problems without broadening our understanding of what we really are. Uh, right now we are um, souls in physical bodies in a hostile nature. That is what we have been trained to believe. Um, and we must subdue that and it is automatically an other to us. So in, in a lot of what I've been writing and in the ideas that I've just expressed, these are systematic ways of breaking down those dichotomies. Okay, so uh, uh, just one, one remark on that. Uh, this kind of thinking is commonly called uh, uh, post-humanism when we try not to put human somewhere mm. above any other um, objects in the world. But however, the way, uh, the way it's being um, uh, conceptualized and basically what this is kind of what you said, I like to call it a hyperhumanism because we don't want to, to bring uh, human down to the level of, of other uh, objects in, in the nature, but we rather want to elevate uh, the nature to the, to the level of, 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 uh, of, of human in terms of their, politici uh, of their political being, having uh, identity. Uh, uh, so this is the way yes. I would rather yes, this would is like the, to look at this. This is the opposite maneuver mm -hmm. to what Timothy Morton and the dark ecology movement are doing. Because what they're doing is, is saying um, uh, e ecology is, is all humanity essentially doesn't e exist. Um, uh, it's a potentially nihilistic perspective. And I'm saying the opposite. I'm, what I'm doing is I'm bringing back the gods. I'm reanimating nature as, um, as a partner. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and of course I'm doing it in a speculative, uh, literary, uh, metaphoric, and um, probably scientifically unjustifiable manner. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but I'm not claiming to be a subject matter expert or uh, to be anything other than an author in this particular maneuver. Uh, I would just like to know what other people get from these ideas and where they can run with them. Mm -hmm. um, people who are better qualified than me. Fair enough. Okay, so I don't know questions. Okay, we have questions here. Okay, I see. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so I would like to ask, thank you very much for this interesting conversation. I would like to ask you to maybe to try to explain uh, in what way people with whom you work, especially those representing governmental and commercial actors, how they use and wh what they need for, and how they use this or similar visions of futures mm -hmm. when uh, you cooperate with them mm -hmm. as uh, in your professional way. I'm very interested in that. Sure. Thanks. Uh, what I have been doing for about 10 years now is um, taking the results of, this is primarily what I do, take the results of studies that other people have done that have resulted in a very large number of complex findings and produce a fiction or a story that communicates those findings in such a way, and this is the way I usually express it, in such a way that even a four-star general can understand it. <laughs> um, in, in other words, therefore, 
people who would ordinarily not have the patience or time to, uh, or perhaps the, the training to, you know, wade through the entire report, read every page and, and, and understand everything. So most of what I do in, in that realm is simple um, reportage. Uh, it's a form of journalism, if, if you will. Uh, there is a, 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 another uh, version, though, where I write a story that deliberately um, raises questions uh, or presents new ideas. For instance, I just did a, uh, a fiction, fictional piece for the U.S. Air Force um, about artificial intelligence. And one of the things that they were very, very confidently proclaiming was that they, would, they were in the middle of coming up with a system for getting different artificial intelligences to communicate. Um, they, this one has some knowledge about the world and it communicates that knowledge to this one. Straightforward, right? Um, so uh, I, I wrote into this story you know, an attempt by one AI to do this with another AI and complete failure because the, 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 what is it, the Umwelt, the, the worldview of this one is entirely different from that one. Uh, and uh, so, but I answered the question of how you could make this work. I said, there is a common language. It's the natural physical world. So these AIs end up communicating by proxy through physical things in the environment around them. Uh, so they don't need a shared model because they have a shared reality. Uh, so that's the kind of work. Uh, and it's inherently multidisciplinary. There's not very many people who obviously would be doing this kind of thing. And I don't do it very often. Um, but uh, it is complementary to um, other projects, typically, that are already in progress. In other words, I have a modest role in a larger structure, typically, when I'm doing this. OK. Uh uh, any other questions? Okay, I don't see any other questions. And oh, okay, there's no, one question. Very, very quick. Very quick. Uh, in solutions and problems that we've discussed, uh, we worked on the knowledge that we currently have, mm -hmm. or that we could more or less input into the system. For example, if we talk about forest, we know what to me measure. We should measure this plant, this temperature, humidity, and so on and so on. But how? could we introduce into the system factors that we do not know? This is the problem of simulation. This is the problem of introducing non-human actors. Right. Uh, and it is always a problem if you are going to um, address it on the, the level of knowledge. Uh, Andy Clark uh, has a, a book called um, Oh, sorry, I'm, I'm going to forget the, the, the title of the book now. Um, he, he's, anyway, produced several books. He, he's like me, more of a, he's a, a cognitive scientist, but he, uh, he writes about um, uh, the interface between cognitive science and computing. Anyway, sorry. Uh, one of the things he talks about is partial programs. Now, a partial program is where you have an algorithm, which is a set of steps like a menu for, for getting to a particular result. And, but you take one of the, or more of those steps and you exchange it for a physical action in the real world. So the partial program, for instance, for, uh, this is an, an American uh, analogy. How do you catch a, a, a fly ball in baseball? Um, the algorithmic solution is you model the arc of the ball using differential equations, which tells you where it will come down. You go to that spot, you put your hand up and grab it. But this isn't actually how humans catch a pop fly, and it's not the most efficient way. The most efficient way is to run backwards, keeping a fixed angle between the horizon and the ball, and your hand occluding the ball. Those are physical actions. So, there are some cognitive scientists who believe that human cognition is partial programs all the way down. That whenever the brain can appeal to the physical world to
to replace having to do a calculation of its own, it will. And there's a reason for this, which is that the physical world is always right. <laughs> um, so this is the same answer as the answer of the two AIs trying to communicate with one another. We're just putting it together there's in one There's a common unit. denominator. Reality is a common denominator that allowed them to, yeah. to, to communicate. The reason that this is not a, has not been a current idea is because we have inherited a philosophy that says that thought is on the one hand, dumb matter is on the other. Mm. This turns out not to be correct. Uh, and when the two are combined, we, we see that cognition or thinking is a physical activity. Um, and therefore, the more that we offload uh, these steps into the physical world, the more uh, uh, actual in innovative, creative answers can be produced by what would appear to be a, uh, a dumb algorithm. This is, in fact, the way um, natural selection creates um, novelty, uh, not by the intervention of an omniscient thinker who, who designs, but by allowing the physical world to intervene. So it's a potential answer. Um, uh, bear in mind that I, I try and be as convincing as I, I, I can when I give answers to questions like this. And once again, I could be completely wrong. <laughs> <laughs> OK, ladies and gentlemen, on that, an activist and a body <laughs> note, we need to uh, wrap up our panel. Thank you very much, our guests, to, to, to being so nice and, and agreeing to talk to us. Thank you very much Thank for taking the time on, on this and, day. And, and we'll meet at another Galap talk.